Okay, let me illustrate the difference between Danish and Dutch bicycle planning. Both cultures have a tradition of eating chocolate on bread. In the Dutch version, you take some bread and then you take their hagelslag and you sprinkle it on like this. In Denmark, the standard modus operandi is a slice of rye bread. But then you take a chocolate wafer, which is called polleg chocolate. The wafers are designed to fit onto the standard sizes of the rye bread. It is all chocolate deliciousness, but there is randomness and there is design. Hey everybody, how you doing? I'm Michael, urban designer, author, host of the documentary series about urbanism, the life-size city, and this is the YouTube channel for the series, otherwise known as Urbanism's Dodgy Dive Bar on the internet. You might have heard me mention the word transferability a few times in episodes of the TV series and also here on the channel. I think it's high time for a bicycle urbanism transferability masterclass. I am privileged to have what I really think is the coolest job in the world, working in urbanism in over 100 cities all over the planet, trying to make these places better however I can. I have also cycled for transport in probably over 150 cities through my work in urbanism, but also when I'm visiting a city to give a keynote at a conference. I can tell you that cycling in 95% of those cities is absolutely crap. But there are places that I enjoy cycling, like Japan. Oh, the world's third great cycling nation, man. It is a joy every time I'm there. I love cycling in certain German cities. <laughs> Not all of them, believe me but some of them. And I absolutely adore cycling in Dutch cities like Amsterdam. But if I had to choose a city, based on all these cities that I've worked in, all these cities that I've cycled in, if I had to choose a city to cycle in daily, I'm gonna go with Copenhagen every single time. The uniformity of the best practice infrastructure network is seductive, like all good design is. 63% of Copenhageners who ride a bike to work or education every single day in this city are also a sign of that. I love most of the projects that I work on in cities. Not all of them, but most of them. But working in Dutch cities is always extra cool. When you're from Copenhagen, man, it's like coming home to a familiar place that understands you. I'll guess that FC Barcelona look forward to El Clasico against Real Madrid more than other matches. They're on the same level. There is a completely different dynamic. Now, apparently there is a commercial for Dutch cycling circulating here on YouTube. A few people have sent me a link to it. It also seems to use American advertising standards in that it directly attacks its perceived competition. I'll link to it down in the description. Now, from what I understand from people in my network, it's not made by urban planners or people who understand design. Apparently, it is expat vloggers who are making commercials about Dutch cycling culture. Nothing wrong with that at all. But it seems to be that they're trying to start some kind of rumble, <laughs> rumble in the urban cycling jungle. And man, I'm sorry, that is just hilarious. It's like you can almost hear them faintly in the distance. Netherlands, Netherlands. Now, this isn't the place to get into the intricacies of the historical development of different cultural differences. But if you're bored, I would suggest looking at the influence of Lutheranism on Danish culture and the influence of Calvinism on the Dutch. But, spoiler alert, I can tell you that moody Calvinists trying to pick a fight with a Nordic Lutheran culture, man, it's never going to be interesting for anybody. But it is a bit weird how this characteristic has emerged, this we're the best rhetoric that seems to be prevalent. The Netherlands is the best country in the world for cycling. That is a statement that will cause every single one of my colleagues here in Denmark and abroad to say, yeah, duh. Of course it is. It is absolutely amazing. And this is not news. It is clear, however, that these vloggers don't have an understanding about the infrastructure choices made in Denmark, the evolution of them over the past century, the comprehensive research that is constantly done on the subject. <sighs> but hey, here's a masterclass in transferability regarding bicycle urbanism with a focus on urban planning and design that you just might not get from commercial vloggers. I go into this in greater detail in my book, Copenhagenized, the definitive guide to global bicycle urbanism, and yeah, link in the description. Let me explain it like this. For more than a decade, apart from my work in cities around the world, I have led, yeah, like over a thousand people on study trips here in Copenhagen. Politicians, policymakers, students, professionals, you name it. As well as hosting masterclasses in bicycle urbanism. Many of the people who come from afar double up on their study trip by visiting Amsterdam and other Dutch cities on their way to Copenhagen. More inspiration for their money. When they get here, 
I have made a point for basically over a decade to ask them a very simple question. First of all, what was it like cycling in Dutch cities like Amsterdam? The response is absolutely unanimous. Oh my God, it was amazing. It was a dream come true. It was fantastic, I, mind blowing. And yes, it is. Probably more so if you come from a city in North America, but yeah, every single time it is amazing. And then I ask all these people, if they squinted their eyes when they were in Amsterdam, could they envision their own city while standing there? And again, the response is unanimous. Oh, no. God, no, not at all. It's completely different. It's crazy different, the typology of that city. What about when you're here in Copenhagen, I ask? And everybody says the same thing. Oh, yes, absolutely. They can see Chicago, Seattle, Melbourne, Winnipeg, Mexico City, you name it, if they squint their eyes here in Copenhagen. Outside of the thousand-year-old city center, Copenhagen and the surrounding area really is a 20th century invention. Wide streets for the trams that we used to have, early century buildings that resemble those in many other cities in the world. The opportunity for transferability is crystal clear among all the people that I have been asking for more than a decade. Some colleagues I have in North America a few years ago dropped Amsterdam from their urban planning study trip agenda and took people instead to Rotterdam because the transferability there is far more apparent. And I totally get that. And yeah, let's be realistic. For all the charm and quirky cuteness, there will never be another Amsterdam or another Utrecht or Groningen. Unless, of course, one of the Gulf states decides to build a replica somewhere in the desert between Dubai and Abu Dhabi. And let's face it, that could probably happen. A search for inspiration can take place anywhere, but a search for transferability and real-world applications to similar typologies, however, they need to be more focused and realistic. When you come from Copenhagen, cycling in Amsterdam feels, like I said before, like you're coming home. To a different kind of home, absolutely, but still a home. An eclectic home with piles of books in no particular order, some funky art on the walls, maybe some dirty dishes in the sink, but cool music on the stereo, and a well-stocked bar. Different from your own Nordic home with clean lines, hardwood floors, carefully placed furniture, and minimalistic art on the walls, but still a home. I've often said that cyclists in Amsterdam resemble swarming bees, whereas in Copenhagen they look more like marching ants. This is largely due to the layout of the cities and the historical development of them. In Amsterdam, the streets are curvy and confusing, and you, you have a lot of left and right turns in the course of a day. Here in Copenhagen, you're cycling primarily on long, straight stretches. Naturally, this creates a different dynamic. Okay, let me illustrate the difference between Danish and Dutch bicycle planning. Both cultures have a tradition of eating chocolate on bread. Bread is great. Chocolate is fantastic. In the Dutch version, you take some bread. The ones I've eaten at lunch on jobs in the Netherlands were white bread. And then you take their hagelslag, or something hopefully resembling that, which is basically chocolate sprinkles. And you sprinkle it on like this. In Denmark, the standard modus operandi is a slice of rye bread. The shape and the size of the loaves have been standardized. But then you take a chocolate wafer, which is called polleg chocolo. The wafers are designed to fit onto the standard sizes of the rye bread. It is all chocolate deliciousness, man. But there is randomness and there is design. As cities return to bicycles as transport, structure is integral for design thinking and understanding, for uniformity, for ease of use, for expanding the infrastructure later, for safety. I've had conversations about this with many Dutch colleagues and it is always super interesting. As one of them put it, the Netherlands developed the same best practice standards as Denmark did back in the day, back in the 1920s and the 1930s. But then he said with a great deal of frustration that, oh, but Dutch cities are just lazy in their planning. No uniformity or cohesive design vision. Now, when I am working in or visiting Amsterdam, I usually stay at the same hotel. It's about a 20 minute bike ride from Central Station. Let me try and illustrate what my Dutch colleague means by the random and lazy planning in Dutch cities. This is the route from my hotel to the bike rental shop that I use, which is right near Central Station. The route starts out well. A separated unidirectional cycle track leads me away from the hotel. Near the first intersection, the surface suddenly changes to paving tiles of varying colors. Then all of a sudden, I'm on a bi-directional for some bizarre reason. And then I meet my first beg button for crossing the street. Having to apply for permission from a computer model to cross a street on my bicycle is a foreign concept to a Copenhagener. I couldn't reach it due to the roadworks, but the workman there, he pressed it for me with a smile. 
Super nice. Then, because I was turning left, another beg button, and I had to wait. No efficient traffic light signalization like at home. Back on a unidirectional with asphalt and just a painted line. More beg buttons to cross streets, and then I'm back on a bi-directional, and I couldn't really figure out why. Then, suddenly, tiles appeared beneath my cargo bike again. And then, this quirky solution across a bridge. Farther along, another of those damned buttons. This was a nice stretch though, a wide buffer from the motorized traffic. Then another button in a totally different design. If you're a visitor, you might not even realize what that thing does. And then another damn button, which was meant to send me across the intersection, which it did after a wait. Into the arms of another button, which was sending me on a left turn, which was strange because I just wanted to go straight. Another bi-directional. This is like a video game, man. There is never a dull moment. My desire lines at this point, however, had just rolled their eyes and left the building. Cobblestones as I crossed this small street, then a split bi-directional for a while, until I turned left at a confusing intersection, where I found myself sharing the street with fast-moving cars. And then the last stretch to my destination was a narrow painted lane. Now I got from my A to my B calmly, safely and without too much stress. But that's also because I know this route by heart by now. The first two times I had to do it, it was a navigational nightmare. There were, however, nine changes in surface material, half a dozen different types of bicycle infrastructure, and six times I had to push a button to cross the street. And that's not counting the three or four times where I actually made the light. All of this on a 20 minute bicycle journey. If you live in a city, you learn the language of the local infrastructure, absolutely. But the indicator of how successful the design is is how easy it is for visitors to figure it out. The Dutch who come to Copenhagen, be it colleagues on study trips or the many Dutch I have hosted in a rented room in my home through Airbnb, they all say the same thing. Oh my God, it is so easy to get around. You don't have to wonder where the infrastructure might lead you. It just serves you well. A lot of the Dutch also say that, oh, people cycle faster here in Copenhagen. It's a marginal difference from Amsterdam, but there is a perception that people cycle faster. And that is, like I said, due to the fact that we have a lot of long, straight stretches. But a similar route to the one I just illustrated here in Copenhagen would be one of uniform design, surfaces, and facilities. There wouldn't be any video game gameplay to deal with. It's largely the same in other Danish cities. You get off the train with your bike and you are presented with the same infrastructure typology. You understand it instantly and it takes you where you need to go without much hassle. In Danish bicycle planning, there are four types of infrastructure and only four. One of these four types fits every street in the Danish kingdom and every street in every city in the world. This makes it much easier for any town or city to agree on which infrastructure should be implemented in any given place. Now, there are some cultural aspects that are in play. To be fair, Denmark is a design nation. Design is so deeply rooted in our culture. My kids learned about the three principles of Danish design, which are carved in stone, functional, practical, elegant, when they were in the third grade. So sure, Danes have different expectations about design, be it in their home or in public space, and that includes bicycle infrastructure. But luckily, good design is not restricted to one country or one culture. It has a universality that is absolutely transferable. I'll link in the description to an article I wrote about what my kids thought about cycling in the Netherlands for the first time a few years ago. Two design-oriented Copenhagen kids. It is really interesting. As I mentioned at the beginning, I absolutely love cycling in Japan. You can see a clip about it in the season one Tokyo episode of The Life Size City. I love it, but not a lot of it is transferable. Sure, their train station parking like this at Fukushima Station and every other city is amazing. Or facilities like here at Ikebukuro Station in Toshima, complete with small conveyor belts to get your bike up the stairs. You see this kind of stuff all over the place. Four million people a day. Basically, the population of Berlin ride a bike to a train station every day in Japan. But the typology of their streets and neighborhoods make a lot of it completely non-transferable. Also due to the cultural interference in the process because of the uniqueness of Japanese culture. If we compare the typologies of two cities like Copenhagen and Amsterdam, we can see how transferability becomes an important factor to consider. So the Netherlands is the best country for urban cycling on the planet, in the world, in the universe, ever. Yes, absolutely. They are the Ronaldo of urban cycling. It is fantastic. Denmark doesn't feel the need to be the best. We just try to focus on improving. And we have a lot of local battles still waging. So that means that we cannot rest on our laurels. So maybe we're the Messi to their Ronaldo. And that metaphor might even make more sense now that I think about it. One of them is, I am the king. 
look at me every time he scores a goal. The other one is just always smiling and looking like he's really enjoying his job. Look at this way of the celebrations. Whenever I come to the finish line, I do like this. Glasses, winner. Uh, the no? It's the Pim de Kaisergracht way. Do we need bicycle nationalism? Is it helpful to us on our journey to try and improve cities all over the world? No and no. The bicycle simply doesn't deserve to be hijacked like that. It also drowns out other parts of the conversation. I have cycled in a city with 30% modal share in the middle of Italy. Who knew? I have visited small Brazilian towns where the modal share has been over 60% for over a century, nothing has ever changed. Places where 90% of children ride their bike to school. Then there are cities like Oulu, Finland, Malmo, Sweden, Bordeaux, Mexico City, Seville. There's a little town in the Czech Republic with 18% modal share that the rest of the Czech Republic doesn't even know about. There is so much inspiration that deserves to be heard. If you're seeking inspiration to reestablish the bicycle in a city after an absence of many years, oh, be bedazzled by Dutch cities. Get some solid inspiration and some really useful transferable ideas. And while you're there, tell the Dutch how amazing they are because for some bizarre reason, they really want to hear it. I've been using a Disneyland metaphor for years. Dutch cities really are fantasy land. Oh, the dream of dreams through the organic randomness of centuries of urban development. On the other hand, using the yardstick of transferability, then maybe Copenhagen is Tomorrowland. The inspiration is attainable, realistic and useful for most cities on the planet. Copy, paste, control C, control V. But then I'm thinking at the end of the day, man, this must be hilarious for other people, for the rest of the world, watching the Dutch <laughs> and their expats try to pick a bicycle urbanism fight, man. Like, come on. Luckily, the professionals that I know who work in design and planning, who are trying to improve their cities, they know how to filter. Like I've been saying for years, it is a supermarket of tried and tested ideas from both countries. Get shopping. So leave the bicycle nationalists to their vlogging and their endless rude comments on social media because there are more important things to deal with right now. We are trying to make our cities better after messing up for a century. We're trying to improve urban lives here today and well into the future and we need all the inspiration we can get. And we need to move forward together. And we need to learn from each other's mistakes because we've all made them. But yeah, let us understand the importance of transferability and respect the design principles that are universal. Now, if you'll excuse me, I have some actual urban planning to do. So Colville Anderson is out. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time. Hot for Dahmer. Denmark, ehrlicher, ehrlich!